Hi, today we're looking at the ESD simulator project again and if you watched the last video you know I took a look at this 15,000 volt uh, flyback generator. The main problem with this was that it isn't regulated in any way, there's no real feedback. So basically you can actually get quite a wide range of voltages out depending on the spark gap that you have here. But what I want to do is feed this into a capacitor which means that there wouldn't be a spark gap in place. And so this um, capacitor voltage could float up to anywhere as much as 25 kV when I took a quick measurement from the output of this uh, with these leads quite a long way apart. So this isn't really suitable for this application. I do want somewhat consistent uh, results each time, even though I'm not going for a, like a laboratory grade result for this ESD simulator. So this time we're going to attempt to use some cold cathode fluorescent inverters to get our high voltage output. So we've got three different ones to have a look at today. Um, I'm not sure whether this one will be suitable. Um, the fact that it's got a fair amount of electronics behind it, I don't know if it's going to have something like, um, you know, the lamp detection. It might not fire up if it doesn't detect a lamp. So this one may be a fail off the bat, but we've got two here which should be fine. Um, and the idea is to feed these into a Cockroft Walton multiplier. So I've had some very inexpensive boards made up by JLC PCB. Despite the fact that it was longer than 100 millimeter, uh, you know, these were still actually very cheap. I've gone for the hot air solder leveled finish because this is all through hole components. So these were very inexpensive. So we've got five of these to play with um, and we've got various components as well. So we've got a whole range of film capacitors. These are rated for 1,500 volts, 22 nanofarads. Um, we've also got some much higher voltage capacitors. We've got some 20 kV ones here, uh, 400 70 picofarads. They are ceramic so we might not get the full uh, capacitance at a higher voltage uh, but for the human body model we only need 100 picofarads. We've got a few others here. Uh, these are 15 kV 150 picofarads and I actually ordered a couple of Russian capacitors from eBay. These ones are rated 20 kV and 100 picofarads so ideally these will be the ones that I actually use in the final design. So we've got a few types of HV diodes, some 1.6 kV and some at 3 kV. So we've got enough to build up uh, one of these boards. Right, so first of all we'll have a little look at the drivers. This is the one that came in the blue box and it's a fairly conventional two transistor oscillator driving this transformer. You can see it's completely symmetrical and then it just drives two outputs but it's actually only a single output winding. You can see one output here goes to each of the outputs and then we've got a capacitor which goes to one output and another capacitor which goes to the other and these are just rated at 6 kV and I think probably 22 nanofarads so uh, this should give us our sine wave output which is obviously suitable for our Cockroft Walton multiplier. Then we've got another inverter which is in this black case but I think based on the weight of this thing it feels like it's probably been potted um, yeah, but actually, I'm not sure if you can make out, it's almost identical in design. In fact, I think it's probably the same design entirely. You can see similar features here. So we've clearly got the inductor, we've got a capacitor here, a couple of transistors, and just the one blue capacitor because we've only got a single output on this module. So this one might be quite nice um, because it's all self-contained and uh, well potted. And then finally, we've got this electronic driver. So let's have a little closer look at this one. This design is based around the Texas Instruments TL494 PWM generator IC. It's actually geared towards switch mode power supplies. It has some additional circuitry in here, so it can take feedback and adjust the duty cycle to maintain your set point. So um, you can see on the connector here, for some reason, the silk screen has been reversed. We've got 12 volts zero volts. We've also got an adjustment so we can tweak the output voltage and then we've got a simple on off control as well. And this switch mode power supply IC is driving this dual channel MOSFET. So it's got two N channel MOSFETs in here which are driving a primary coil here and it looks like we've got some feedback windings on these bottom two on this side. Then we've got the actual transformer itself which then just directly drives the output here. This is just a connector uh, which is commonly used on these cold cathode fluorescent lamps in monitors. It looks like they're actually drawing 
something back here as well as feedback. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to use this without it sort of shutting down if it doesn't detect the right kind of load. Right, so we've got the differential probe hooked up to the inverter board. This is set to 2000 times gain. So let's have a little look at the scope output. And if I turn on the supply to the inverter, here you can see we're getting a consistent output. So it looks like we don't need a minimum load on here, which is good. You can see here that we're reading about 500 millivolts. So with the 2000 times probe, that's about one kilovolt at 46 kilohertz. So that looks like it should be perfectly suitable for our job. Let's have a little look at the other two. Once again, we've got the differential probe hooked up to the inverter board set to the times 2000 scale. If we have a look at the scope output, when we turn on the output here, you can see it's oscillating about 41 kilohertz and we're getting roughly 800 volts output from this board. Now, because there's no voltage reference or anything on this board, if we tweak the input voltage, the output just changes exactly in harmony. So it would be very easy to tweak this board to give us exactly the output voltage that we want. Let's take a little look at the final board. And this inverter said 900 volts at 25 kilohertz. So let's have a look at the scope output and we're getting about 45 kilohertz at around 800 volts. So I imagine this is basically the same circuit as the blue inverter board. So it does look like we could use any of these in our design. I'm tending towards the electronic driver just because it had a slightly higher output voltage, which means that we may not need quite so many stages on our multiplier. So let's just have a little look at the multiplier itself. So we're just simulating this in LT Spice with a sine wave coming in and one stage on the multiplier consists of two capacitors and two diodes. So if we probe this point here and then another stage along and another stage along and another stage along and keep doing that, you can see on each stage we're just stacking the doubling of the incoming voltage on top of each other. So the nice thing about these multipliers is you only need components rated for double the incoming voltage. You don't need um, capacitors and diodes at this end that are rated for you know, 1 kV or 1.2 kV in this case. So it just basically doubles the original incoming voltage and then stacks it on top of the previous stage. And the end result is you end up with an output voltage which is coming close to, uh, in this case, eight times the original incoming voltage. It's not quite eight times because there are losses there's, um, you know, diode drops, that kind of thing. But and effectively, every time you add one stage consisting of these four components, you double your original incoming voltage. So an eight-stage multiplier should give us approximately eight times the incoming voltage. So let's try soldering up this board and see if it behaves the same as the simulations. And to solder these components in, we are going to try using this solder wire from Solder King Assembly Materials, which Chris Ward kindly sent through. This is a lead-free alloy and the SC100 is the way that the industry is going really. So eliminating the copper and that kind of thing that have been in some of the uh, lead-free alloys previously. This is basically 100% tin with a few other materials and flux obviously. Um, so we'll see how this behaves when soldering. Now one other little piece of equipment which I recently acquired becoming a little bit less relevant these days because people are moving towards surface mount devices is one of these little leg formers. So I haven't uh, got one of those proper le leg forming machines, but this is a really nice low cost alternative. So for something like these diodes where they normally come with the leads like this, all you do is find out where on here matches the spacing of the PCB underneath. So you can see here that we're about in the right place. And then you simply just place the diode or resistor or whatever in the former like this, hold it in place and bend the legs down and basically it centers the component perfectly on the bent legs and then when you put it into the PCB you get the perfect spacing every time and everything looks nice and neat. So let's try soldering up this board.
So I'm just having a play with this Solder King solder wire and it does actually flow very nicely into the joints. It is a little bit grainy as you can see but it's really quite a shiny alloy compared to some of the other lead free solders that I've tried in the past. So it does seem to be flowing pretty well and actually I think if you were soldering away um, not necessarily inspecting the joints for the grain structure you wouldn't actually know that you're using lead free solder because it actually flows very nicely into the solder joints. You know, I've used some particularly poor lead-free solders from the early days that really just didn't want to flow very well. So the flux composition in this does seem to be uh, particularly suited to this alloy and it does seem to be giving pretty good results. So overall I'm quite happy with this solder wire. Just for comparison we'll do a couple of joints with the multi-core lead solder just as a comparison. Um, I think we'll notice that these joints are considerably shinier And yeah, it's quite clear that those are lead solder. In fact, you can see my reflection in this solder joint. Um, these are the lead free ones. They are a little bit more uh, crusty as you can see, but certainly it flows very well and doesn't seem to give any uh, real problems. So it'll be interesting to see how this solder behaves when we do some drag soldering, when I solder up the remaining uh, parts on the nightlight PCB, which we'll do in a few days. The multiplier is hooked up to the inverter board and I think this inverter board was the one that had approximately 800 volts peak output or 1600 volts peak to peak. So with this eight stages we should hopefully see about 12 kV, 12.8 kV out from the output. Obviously you've got to remember we've got quite a few losses with the diodes and everything so we probably won't get 12.8 kV but somewhere around there would be a good start. We've got the HV probe, this is a 1000 to 1 probe connected to the multimeter and that is resting on the HV output pin. So for every 1 millivolt we read on here, that equals 1 volt of the output. Or for every kV, it should be 1 volt on the multimeter. And this probe is referenced to this terminal here, so this is effectively our negative DC and that's our positive DC and we've got our AC input from the inverter. So let's turn on the bench power supply and see what happens. Hopefully it doesn't blow up. And yeah, we're reading about 12 kV. That's pretty good. Just dropping a little bit there. And we'll turn it off. And there's no bleeder resistor or anything on here, so it's going to take a little bit of time to decay. We might need to discharge this manually. Right, so this time we've got one of these 150 picofarad capacitors connected to the output of the multiplier. So let's see if we're still able to reach our 12 kV output. Let's turn on the input. And that's quite quickly got all the way up to 12 kV. Let's try discharging it. That's a pretty good discharge. I'm not sure if it's showing up on camera because of the speed. Yeah, it seems to work pretty well. So I think this time we've got a much better setup. It's got quite a few advantages over this flyback design. First of all, as you saw with this, the output voltage is actually really stable, especially once we had an output capacitor on here. This barely varied at all. So that's really good to see that we're getting a good stable output voltage. This would vary all over the place. The other advantage is that we don't actually need many high voltage components. If we'd gone ahead with trying to discharge this into the capacitor, we would have needed to find a HV rectifier, so a diode that was capable of at least 15 kV as the output from this. With our Cockroft Walton multiplier, we're able to use a whole series of much lower voltage diodes and capacitors, and actually all of these parts were really cheap. So, um, you know, these diodes I think were probably something like 10 cents each, and the capacitors weren't a whole lot more. This whole design didn't cost very much at all. So, 
I think we're getting pretty close to me being able to build up a design that I can then use to do some basic ESD testing in the lab. One thing that I do need is an output resistor that's capable of 15 kV. If you remember, the human body model does require both a 100 picofarad capacitor and then also a series resistor to mimic the discharge from a human body. So we we're seeing a little bit higher energy from this capacitor. Those sparks are really quite aggressive because the discharge time was very quick. Uh, with the resistor in there, we do slow that down a little bit. So hopefully you're finding this video interesting. When I have come up with a complete design, I will of course upload this to my website, which is linked down below. Uh, thank you to JLC PCB for sending these PCBs for this video. And I think the next time we visit this design will probably be with the final PCBs, um, you know, with a design that we can actually start testing with. So hopefully you enjoyed the video. Any comments or thoughts, please leave them down below. Until next time, thanks for watching.